Welcome to Off the Shelf, a book discussion by the conference board. And today I will be speaking with George Friedman about his latest book, The Storm Before the Calm. Hello, my name is Bart van Arik. I'm chief economist at the conference board and welcome to another edition of Off the Shelf, our book discussions at the conference board. And today I have the pleasure to have a conversation with George Friedman. George is the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures, which specializes in geopolitical forecasting. Prior to 2015, uh, Friedman was the chairman of the global intelligence company Stratfor, which he founded in 1996. Friedman is the author of six books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Next 100 Years and The Next Decade. And he lives in Austin, Texas, but is with us today here in New York. And we're going to speak with George about his latest book, The Storm Before the Calm. George, welcome to our podcast series Off the Shelf. It's good to be here. Great. So actually, this is my second conversation with you, George. Um, in just a few months, we spoke back in November about the geopolitical forecast for 2020. And we then discussed your sobering forecast that 2020 might become a really difficult year because of increased economic dysfunctioning, rising social tensions, ongoing troubles on the trade side, uh, downward pressures on production and everything else. Today, of course, we'll take a much broader look and a bigger picture uh, and look at your latest book, The Storm Before the Calm. However, before we go to the big picture, I'd like to briefly discuss where we are. We're now sort of, you know, almost two months into the new year. And uh, at the time that it seems that the biggest short term threat is actually coming out of left field, as is so often the case with crises, and that's the coronavirus. That was not on our agenda back in November. And uh, while we don't, of course, at this point know what exactly will happen, the fact is that the situation is not under control and it worries enormously from a perspective of global impact and the human cost that uh, we're paying for that. So the question I want to start with, actually, is whether these type of events like the coronavirus, totally unexpected, whether that fits into the grand scheme of things, or would you say this is just a short-term thing, irrespective of the human uh, cost, which we don't want to play down, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't play a big role. Well, I'd say, like stress, viruses like this reveal the weakness of the system. Um, the issue here, and I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't possibly tell you about coronavirus, but when I take a look at the different impact on different countries, I look at China, and what's interesting is the manner in which the system spasmed. It, it didn't know how to deal with it. That first, the apparently Xi knew about it or didn't know about it for two weeks and did nothing publicly because he was doing brilliant things privately. Uh, then they began to cordon off entire cities. So when you look how a natural disaster is handled by a government, well, it doesn't tell you much about the natural disaster, mm -hmm. but it tells you a great deal about that government. Our view of China has always been that it was vastly overestimated in its modernity, that it had had an extraordinary period of economic growth, but that it was a dead cat bounce. That is, it was so, it left in such poor conditions by Mao that they were going to grow. And that as they grew, massive dysfunctions within the economy and within the relationship of the economy to the government were revealing themselves. Well, that really is a question of what is the relationship of the government to the people? And the coronavirus tests that. Mm. And we see what the government is. It is falling back on its comfort zone of repression. And that's China. So yes, it tells you a great deal. And whether it speeds up the compression of China, the decline of China, if you will, uh, that's important. But China had topped. China could not sustain itself at the level it was. It was going as Japan had, going backwards. And the only thing the coronavirus does then for them is speeds up a process that we've already been underway. Yeah. So I think what you're basically saying, yes, an event like the coronavirus is coming out of left field. You can't predict it. But the way it's been handled, the way it is relating to the institutions and the governance of the country, that is something that you could see coming and that would face uh, China at some point in time. That's what you would have expected. And it gives you a prism through which to look at what's happening. Right. So... The fact that the virus happens, well, 
I don't know where it goes or what it does. The fact that I can tell something about the Chinese government, that's important. Yeah. Well, this is a good segue in what we're going to talk about, which is the book uh, The Storm Before uh, the Calm, the uh, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s, and The Triumph Beyond. It's a huge topic. But nevertheless, first of all, I have to say it was a fantastic book to read. Uh, it's very well written. It's consistently argued. And it's a tour de force to cover more than two centuries, uh, including the tensions of today and an in-depth look towards the future. So in about 250 pages. So congratulations. It's, uh, it's a major piece of work. Interestingly, I want to start today with a quote from the last page instead of the first page. Uh, this quote says the following. America is a country in which the storm is essential to clear the way before the calm. Because Americans obsessed with the present and the future have difficulty remembering the past, they will all believe that there has never been a time as uncivil and tense as this one. Now, I'm a European and uh, having have lived there most of my life, but having lived for more than 12 years now in the United States, that feels a little bit true uh, quite often when you look at the discourse that we're having every day. Um, I think you describe that specific characteristic of American uh, society to the fact that America, in contrast to countries in Europe or in Asia, is an invented nation. And there are three components to that invention, as you describe. It's the regime, it's the land, and it's the people. Why are the aspects of being invented or perhaps being reinvented over time so important to understand America's present and future? We feel a moral obligation to invent our obsession with the technology, the obsession with uh, the structures that we change. and re This is who we are. Because all of us came from a place that didn't want us there and where we, we didn't want to be. We are all, no one said, well, I have $50 million. I think I'll become a settler in the Midwest. We came here because we'd failed elsewhere. And we came and reinvented our lives. And there was a huge degree of amnesia in that, or changing memories where things were worse than they ever were there. But we have a strange relationship to reality because we're moving away from it. Well, as we've succeeded, the impulse to invent, to reinvent, is always there. And all inventions and reinventions reach their end point. And those of us raised within the context of one technology, one regime, one economic process, feel an enormous loss when it leaves, because that's what comforts us. And they always leave, and they always change. And so we must reinvent a new life. And it's a period, it's, it's something within the American soul that is urgently trying to create something new. And the tragedy of American life is that the thing that's created always becomes obsolete. And when it becomes obsolete, as this period has, then there's rage, there's sorrow, and there's the conviction that this is the worst of all times. Does the invented nation have something to do with American dream, uh, which everybody's talking about? And if that's the case, I mean, there's some people who say the American dream is dead, it doesn't exist anymore. Does that mean that we're actually seriously threatening the inventiveness of the American nation? I don't think we're, it's threatened. I think the challenge is always there. Remember, we've gone through this process of institutional change and social change many times, mm. and they all look alike. So I don't think the inventiveness has changed, uh, but the desperation must rise. Remember, we were driven by desperation. When desperation isn't there, we believe that we've reached th heaven, and then it comes again, and we cycle between the two. So the American dream still exists, it's just that sometimes it feels like a nightmare. Well, the American dream is what was created it. I tell the story of George Washington's great-grandfather. Uh, he was a Catholic who was driven out of England uh, by Protestants who came to North America and settled and wanted to recreate the life of an English gentlemen. And his dream was that. My family came here and wanted to go live in a place where no one was trying to kill them. That was their dream. But every one of us has come here with a dream. And the charity of America, so many of them succeeded. 
But in that success, there's always a dread of losing it. There's always this feeling of insecurity. Yeah. And it's a good one because it makes you careful, it makes you aggressive. It doesn't make you pleasant, as Europeans will say. <laughs> but we are always looking at the Europeans suspiciously, uh, you know, wondering yeah. what exactly they're about. Yeah. And there's a vast difference between the two continents. Yeah, no, very clearly so. So you're talking then, when you talk about invention, you talk about the regime and land and people. I, I want to take a little bit of a deep dive into people, which I think is a very interesting part. You, 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 talk, you talk about sort of three, maybe four parts, characteristics of the people when it comes to American inventiveness. That's the cowboy, the inventor, and the warrior. And you stress the importance of subtlety here uh, and admitting that uh, that isn't necessarily always the characterization of American culture when you look at it superficially. But again, I want to quote what you're saying. There's technology, there's business, and there's war. They appear to be different. But in American life, the scientist, the cowboy, and the warrior, and add to this the businessman, are part of a single culture. Can you explain that? We live in a state of combat. Uh, I tell the story of uh, Gary Cooper in High Noon and how his moral imperative was not to his community, not to uh, the nation, it was to himself. He was afraid to die a coward. And when we look at business, there is a profound sense of self in the founder in the person who maintained it, the person who crashed it. So when you look at the United States and you look at the cowboy myth, mm -hmm. you look at the reality of the inventor, of Thomas Edison, of the Bill Gates, of Elon Musk, with their vast personalities and events. When you look at the warrior who goes off to war for himself, you see an interesting dimension of American life. The sense of duty is to self. And that fuels business. Because business, as Adam Smith said, had a selfish core. Well, this core is more than selfish. It's more complex. It's more interesting. But in the end, it's who you are. In Europe, they ask you where you're from. They ask you many things. Here, they start, what do you do? They want to know what work you do. That defines who you are. And that work is frequently combat. But let me challenge a little bit that on the latter, because what I quite often hear when I speak with Americans is the where do you come from also has to do with, you know, where do your where do your grandparents come from or your parents or your great-grandparents and are they from Scotland or are they coming from Norway or from Italy or whatever so there is also a sense of identity that is still linking back to that old world but how does it then come together in a unique way here in America well that's the second question uh, the first question is what do you do yeah and where do your people come from or so on well it's something that couldn't be asked in Europe because first you have to ask, do your parents come from anywhere else? Here, all of us come from somewhere else. There is no one, even the Indians came from somewhere else. They conquered tribes, they enslaved them. I mean, we all share the common experience of coming here, fleeing the past, and then going to war. If the war is business, if the war is uh, taking the West, whatever it was, we went to war. And yeah, I mean, you can ask that question, you must, because yeah, my wife is from Australia, I am from Hungary, the two of us get along fairly well, <laughs> but there are differences that come out at various times. We are both Americans, we're both deeply committed to it, and yet there retains in our souls our homes. Yeah, that's and, and that's perhaps then the u uniqueness indeed of the American uh, thinking around you know progress and invention and everything else. Yeah, it, it is shared by places like Australia or some parts of Canada and uh, New Zealand. The Five Eyes, as we call it. Yeah, it's not shared by the British. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly true. 
You're listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast series by the Conference Board. Today I'm speaking with George Friedman to speak about his latest book, The Storm Before the Calm. Let's take a quick break for some announcements from the Conference Board. Stay with us. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the Conference Board, a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. Welcome back to Off the Shelf, a podcast series by the Conference Board. Today I'm speaking with George Friedman uh, about his latest book, The Storm Before the Calm. George, let's move a little bit to the core concepts in your book, which is the existence of two critical cycles, the institutional cycle and the socio-economic cycle. And let's start with the institutional cycle. As you say, typically lasts about 80 years. Uh, the first one was from the time of the Constitution until the end of the Civil War and then uh, and the amendments to the Constitution. The second then lasted until the end of World War II. And the one we are currently in, which you predict to basically end uh, towards the end of the present decade, the 2020s. And you basically argue that institutional cycles end, and when they end, it's because of the institutional arrangements, especially the relationship be between government and people that don't align any longer. So basically there's a breakdown in that relationship between government and people. Please, can you help us explain what is bringing the current institutional arrangement to an end? Well, the last institutional arrangement grew out of World War II. I mean, grew World War II, and you could look at the Manhattan Project just as a small example we discovered the extraordinary power of expertise. We discovered expertise in technology, expertise in management, in many things. And we, after World War II, we continued intruding on society, but more than that, we had governments of experts. The strength of experts is they truly know a narrow field. Their weakness is they don't know the whole. And this created two problems. When they wrote the healthcare regulations, they ran many, many thousands of pages. No one person understood all of them, and no one person knows how to do it. But each piece is superb. The second problem is that because this government of expertise is created, the First Amendment has been violated. The right to petition the government for fixing grievances. It is impossible for most American citizens to petition the government in any meaningful way. Yeah, you're describing this example that, and actually you can see it in the Lincoln movie, that people are queuing up at the door of the president to basically bring very mundane issues to him and he would address them. And that's probably not possible now, but okay. this is possible, which is to say, if you go to a tax office or if you go to the Social Security office or something, you, you meet a person. And that person has absolutely no power. That person is bound up by the complex regulations of the expert, which he or she may not even understand. And you are petitioning your government. You have a grievance. And there's no one you can reach. Now, the corporations have their lobbyists they can petition the government very effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, NGOs have the mechanism of petitioning the government. But I, in a routine, trivial matter having to do with some confusion over Medicare, am taken to a person whose expertise is in administering a complex uh, right set of regulations, and there is no give. So there, what has fled from the system is common sense. Yeah. And the right of the government to confront a citizen and say, well, we didn't plan for this, but he here's a solution. They don't have that power. Because when there's expertise, when the technocracy, as it's called, lays something out, 
they have anticipated all things, they think, and they haven't. And at this point, the level of frustration with the government and their decisions is not nearly as serious as the fact that no one understands what has been decided. And the problem rests with the fact that the old political bosses mm. are gone. Uh, they are no longer there to mediate. There is no mediator. Uh, and there's no give in the regulations. And there's no clarity in the regulations. And the government is creating a crisis with the public because of this. Yeah, so you, you, you mentioned in this uh, technocratic overreach of the government. Um, and and you mentioned it just to, it's coming the need to bring common sense back. So, what is it that makes me feel living in the moment of the day that I feel like okay, but this society has become a heck of a lot more complex than it was 250 years ago? Maybe that's not right what I'm saying, but it feels like that. It's extremely complex, many more people, many more traditions, uh, and so on and so forth. If you now apply common sense, it also feels the world becomes much more arbitrary. You gave the example of the political bosses, privileges, and all those kind of things that actually make it more difficult for people to participate in a society. So can we can we still work with a common sense today that is fair and gives people uh, fair access to uh, the, the resources to improve their living standards? The more complex something is, the clearer the exits and the ex entrances have to be. The fact that something is complex creates a moral imperative to simplify mm. at least some aspect of it. Unless you belong to te technocracy, where complex problems have to have complex solutions. The Social Security Act, which is a very complex act and a very serious act, was written in some dozen pages. And it was very simple to understand. The idea that complexity should breed more complexity is what we are doing. But as we step back and take a look, what is the result? So if you give power to a clerk to settle a problem, they will make mistakes. But vast mistakes are being made now. Mm -hmm. the, the problem you have is where no one has authority, the republic is lost. Because one of the foundations of the republic is that authority is delegated for the use of the people. And this is a very serious crisis. And the higher up you are in the food chain, the less you experience it. So that when you look at the electoral map, you find that the West Coast went to Hillary Clinton, the Northeast went to Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Between the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains, only three states mm -hmm. went for Hillary Clinton. Right. These are the deplorables. Well, you have to go in and take a look at what's going on there. They're facing a government that strikes them as irrelevant to their needs, and this is where social breakdown comes from. Yeah, and that's a good segue into your second type of cycle. So this is the socioeconomic cycle. The socioeconomic cycle lasts about 50 years, not 80 years. And the latest cycle started, uh, as you argue, around the rise of the Reagan area, uh, with the economy transitioning to a, a change in the tax structure, freeing up money for private investment, a dramatic shift in the industrial structure from manufacturing-driven economy to a more services-driven economy. And that, in turn, affected a, a dislocation of workers relating a little bit to the electoral map, as it looks like today. Now, this will m feel very familiar to many, but what is critical is that for the first time in the 250 years history of the nation, we see the socioeconomic cycle and the institutional cycle ending at the same time. And that doesn't give the reader a great level of comfort, at least it didn't me when I read this through. Will it not make the transition to the next cycle much more difficult because they're ending at the same time, these two different cycles? It could, but I don't think it will. I think it'll make it easier. When Ronald Reagan came into office, he had two things he wanted to do. Okay. One he had to do. He had to do something about 18% uh, interest rates. Uh, the other he wanted to do was change the dynamic of the federal government. Well, it wasn't time and he couldn't do it and he had to fix one without the other. This is the first time in 250 years where we can address two problems simultaneously. One problem, the social problem, are the consequences of the success of the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects of it, which is always financial, is that the cost of money is near zero. Mm -hmm. 
And so anyone who was a boomer and wanted to retire on the 5% that banks were yielding can't do it. This is a social calamity. But along with that, uh, the industrial middle class that had been so important to American life has been smashed. The uh, lower middle class now takes home, it earns about 35000 a year, takes home less than $3,000, can't buy a home. There is a massive dislocation going on in the country that has to be dealt with and will be dealt with, again, as we always love to do, is changing the tax structure. Uh, there's a great deal of money in circulation. Reallocate it. It will be a bloody time of politics. But one of the things we also must do is rationalize the government. Now, people who talk about uh, the regulation of re regard that as rationalization. The criteria of rationalization is usability. So there's the saying among, I won't say it's seen, among technologists, read the manual. There is no manual. There is no manual to read. So we have to, we've gone as far as we can with the World War II model of the expertise. There is no one overseeing who is not an expert who rose from one of these fields. There's no one who's looking at this entire thing and saying, can this work? The president is in no position to do that. He doesn't know what he's advocated. Congress has a staff of experts who are joined in with the others. And it's very difficult to take a look at the health care situation and understand it. In a democratic society, to have such a massive shift taking place without the public knowing of it or being able to petition the government. And we have to remember, they put that into the First Amendment mm. as, as one of the fundamental rights, threatens the republic. So from my point of view, dealing with these two issues simultaneously, dealing with the management of the technocracy, both in a social sense and a, uh, let's call it institutional sense, uh, it gives us an opportunity. Now, naturally, we're Americans, so we will scream at each other. We will charge each other with the high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, there'll be riots. There'll be all of the things we had in the 60s and so on. This is how we do it. But out of this can come a new refounding of the republic. Hmm. So at the end of the book, you say, and that's what you're basically arguing here also in this podcast, the current storm is nothing more than what is normal for this time in America's history and our lives. But still, I have this lingering question. Uh, the American cycles may work again. We may indeed sort of be able to actually take the opportunity and use the end of these two cycles to start a, a new area. But what about the risk of the global cycle, which is the end of American dominance in the world, how about the risk of that overtaking? As you say, at the end of the book, America has turned itself into an empire. And we know what can happen to an empire. So why is the global cycle not a major threat for us to start the, the two new cycles that we were predicting? Well, an empire is not something you declare. It is there. We have the largest economy in the world. Mm. We are the largest importer in the world, which means tremendous political power comes to us. We have the largest military. This sort of power doesn't dissolve overnight. When you look at empires as vast as we are, and there hasn't been one, when we look at the British or the Romans, these lasted centuries. Not because they were virtuous, not because they are pleasant, but because the challenge to them had to be as powerful as they were. Yeah. And so it is very difficult to imagine the American power dissolving. I mean, what could happen that the economy would no longer be this big? What could happen if the military would not be this big? So I think this is a cause for internal cause crisis. We don't want to be an empire. We were the first revolution against empire. Right. We don't want to be in the Middle East. We don't want to be in the South China Sea. The American crisis over empire is not that it might fall, but as with our lives, we walked away from who we were and tried to find some new sanctuary. 
The American dream is a world in which they can have all of these things and not risk anything for it. Well, it's all our dreams. Mm -hmm. But they lived it. Our families lived it, coming here looking for that. So there's the danger, not from foreign powers. Right. Very, very interesting. So a lot more to talk about, but I really want to finish up our conversation uh, as this podcast is also really focused on the business audience. So I want to talk a little bit about the role of technology because it's it's a critical part of your narrative. We already talked about the special role of inventor and business person in the American society. But the real tension today, of course, is the fact that digital technology, which is basically today seen as the general purpose technology akin to steam or electricity or the combustion engine, that, that the digital technology doesn't seem to provide the payoff that has been promised to us. And again, you, you speak of typical phases within the technology cycle. You argue we're already in sort of in the final phase of the cycle where technology continues to be important, but is really not as dynamic anymore. And this is a view that's also put forward, for example, by economist Bob Gordon from Northwestern University. But it, it, it flies a little bit in the face of the fact that many business leaders believe that the real gains from digital still have to come. So why do you find yourself here on the pessimistic side? Uh, and for example, as to how f full flourishing of digital could in fact be the start of the next social economic cycle, and why would you not expect that to be the case? Well, I'm not pessimistic. I'm very optimistic. Uh -huh. There's a new technology coming. And it's not digital. Uh, well, look, the automobile became a commodity in 1915 when Henry Ford opened his factory. By 1965, it was a mature technology. It was being sold by marketing people and not by engineers. There's very little to do with it. It was 50 years later. It is now 50 years since the microchip which I regard as the foundation of digital. Right. I mean, yes. Microchip was introduced. It's 50 years old. And you see the marketing people at Apple desperately trying to find a new version or a new color or something to put an iPhone. It has transformed American society. It has been the inventiveness of the past half century. And it will continue to be enormously important. And now we get into what I call the Concord dilemma. The DC-3 went to Europe in 24 hours. The Constellation went to Europe in 12 hours. The 707 went to Europe in six hours. Mm -hmm. So naturally, we need to build something that will go in three hours. And that was the Concorde. But the cost of it, the complexity of it, and the fact that most people didn't need to get there in three hours uh, meant that the airplane technology had reached a point. There hasn't been that much change. Well, but, but that's true for the consumer side of digital technology. I mean, do our phones and our tablets have to be even faster than they have to do today? Is 5G such a big deal compared to 4G? But from a business perspective, this looks really different. It feels that a lot of companies say, look, this technology has a lot of opportunities that haven't been leveraged Absolutely. yet, that could actually help us to raise productivity, which is extraordinarily low, as you, as you, as you uh, argue in your book. So, so it seems that a lot still has to come. So the argument is that we should all have invested in General Motors in 1965, uh -huh. because they were saying the same thing. Right. <laughs> look, there are many things that will come from this, and many things that will make a great deal of money for entrepreneurs and businesses, just as the automobile remains critical. I mean, this is not the end of it. But the most important thing to look at is the growth of productivity, of individual productivity, slumped in the 2000s, right. late 2000s, and remains low. The enormous burst in productivity that existed in the 1990s, in the late 1980s, over. So yes, you're, uh, there's no question that there's many things that we can still do and will do. The microchip will be with us for centuries. But uh, is this the radical new technology? All I'm saying is it's a good business to be in. It's not high tech. It was high tech. So let's look towards the, two th the 2030s, you know, when the new cycle is going to start. Um, and one thing that you bring up uh, towards the end of the book is the, this era of the aging society we're going to go into. There's a lot of things we don't know for sure, but one thing we know pretty much for sure is that advanced economies, including the United States, will have more of an aging population because birth rates just don't increase that rapidly in a relatively short period of time. So the aging society is really sort of the core problem 
to solve in the next socioeconomic cycle, as you say. It's a potential threat, but it could be turned into a potential opportunity. What is the opportunity that you see there as a driver for this next socioeconomic cycle? So uh, there are two sides to it. First, the aging population. Second, the declining birth rates of younger people. We are moving to a period where the older population will begin to have more political power than the younger in a democratic society. Now this is where technology comes in. Technology comes in when something's needed. Thomas Edison's model, he was a marketing guy, not just an inventor, Right. and he knew what we needed. That's the combination of the inventor and the businessman. Exactly, and Henry yeah. Ford was that. Yeah. And so was Bill Gates, yeah. and so was Jobs, and all of them. So what is it that we need now? Well, this is a reality. We can't legislate reproduction, and we can't shoot the old, I hope. What has to be done is that the diseases of old age have to be mitigated, and the old have to be kept productive. So there are two areas that are emerging. One derives from the microchip, which is robotics, which helps the old live. But most importantly, the, the fundamental understanding of what old age is and how to mitigate it has to be attacked for economic reasons. And so if I were to guess, and I have never made any money in the stock market, so I <laughs> am not a person to tell you, but <laughs> where do we go here? Well, the problem the microchip solved was a problem of rapid communication and rapid management of data was urgent. The urgent question now is what happens to any country that has more old people than young people? And there you have to solve that problem again through technology. But as the microchip was radically different from the internal combustion engine, so too the new technology will be radically different. The microchip will be there. But the exciting possibilities are also the desperately needed ones. And those are where America excels. There's so much in this book, George, that I would love to talk about. Uh, but I can just avoid asking you one little question, a big question actually, but a short answer, which you actually raised at the end of the book. And we started with a real-time topic, this podcast on the coronavirus, we want to end with a real-time topic, which is the climate change issue. And you do talk about it at the end of the book. How does the climate change issue fit in here? Well, I would begin by saying that I was raised with the population explosion, where I was told that by 1970, this by the Club of Rome, we would run out of resources to feed our people. Surprisingly, the population explosion never happened. We have a population shortage. I don't doubt that there is a, a problem with global warming, but none of the models that are run on climate are very good. We don't know much about climate. So I don't know the interaction between global change, global uh, warming, and climate change. All the models that are highlighted always have catastrophic outcomes. In many years of modeling, I've never found any model that had only negative outcomes. The positive outcomes might be hard to see or distant from the problem, but they were there. So like the population explosion before us, much of the discussion of a very important topic has become religious in nature. Mm. You know, what do you believe? Mm -hmm. Well, frankly, I don't care what you believe, I believe, care what's true. But it could very well be if the urgency that you're describing with the aging society, if that urgency in climate change and global warming comes along, that could actually become a driver in the next social economic Yes, cycle. but there's no possibility of the public taking the kinds of, of cuts in standard of living that would be necessary to do this. There's a reason why in all these years we haven't done anything about climate change. It's because no one is convinced. Uh, the scientists aren't convincing. They've convinced themselves and those who want to be convinced. And they're not going to do it. So the reason I didn't write on it was it's not going to happen. I think we have a great topic for our next podcast, but uh, we have to stop here. Again, George, it's a fantastic book, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s, and The Triumph Beyond. George Friedman, thank you for joining us today. 
And if you like uh, this content, uh, then please check in on your podcast platform of your choice or go to our TCB website, conferenceboard.org, where you can see many more series uh, in podcasts that we have available at the Conference Board. My name is Bart van Arden, Chief Economist at the Conference Board.